privilege. Now, if you remember the, the last time I had the privilege of speaking to you, I said that I was the special events pastor, and I was given Padre a rough time about that. I can see the wheels turning. You're saying, so this isn't a special event. Ah, oh, but you would be so wrong. Did you know that today is National Parfait Day? Now, it's not just any parfait. It's National Chocolate Parfait. Use your imagination. Yeah, there's a layer of chocolate. Okay. A layer of nuts. Now there's a big layer of ice cream. Do I have your attention yet? There's chocolate poured over the top. There's some whipped cream on top. There's a cherry on top of that. And today is National Chocolate Parfait Day. What I heard was Sharon said she'd go out and get chocolate parfaits for all of us. <laughs> what I want you to do is imagine that parfait that we won't have later. Imagine that parfait and enjoy that parfait when I tell you a story. Now, if you look on Google, you know, Google knows everything. If you look on Google and ask it, what's the definition of a story? Google will say it's a fictional or a factual telling of events. Okay, this is factual. It's also a parable. Uh, so if you ask Google the definition of a parable, Google will say it's a story. Well, we've already been there. Story that has a biblical or ethical meaning. So let me tell you a story. Okay, back up the time. Years and years, I'm a teenager. Okay, I lived in a small town, not much bigger than Oak Hill. And we went to a church about 20 miles away. This church was surrounded by multiple little towns. My, one of my best friends when I was a teenager was Terry. I loved going home with Terry after church on Sunday because, well, Terry was fun, but his mom, uh, let me tell you, that woman for Sunday dinner would have roast beef with gravy, mashed potatoes that she mashed, and green beans, and corn on the cob. Do I have your attention? Oh, I'll tell you what, Jane was a cook. She loved to cook, and she loved to put her best out for company. And the house was always full. Uh, Terry had a brother and a sister, and they always had company. And somebody would be bound to say, uh, Jane, this is so good. <laughs> and Jane would say, eh, it's not much. And it's not fancy. But... What I have is yours. And she would then go on to dessert. We haven't even touched dessert yet. Okay, for dessert. Are you ready, Dale? We've got homemade hot apple pie. Oh, ice cream that Jane and Mel, her husband, would have made last night and put it in the freezer. And it's, it's not the weak kind of ice cream. It's the kind of ice cream. And again, Jane's response would be, I don't have much, and it's not fancy. But 
What I have is yours. You're welcome to it. Okay, that was that was Jane's pattern week after week after week. And it, it wouldn't matter what the recipe was or what was on the menu for the day. It could be roast beef. It could be steaks. It could be ham from a pig that they had just butchered. It could be, I heard somebody mention fried chicken today. It could be fried chicken, and that chicken was guaranteed to be fresh. It wasn't in the store for a week. It was from their farm. And regardless the menu, the response would be the same. You know what the, the response is? I don't have much. It's not fancy. But what I have is yours, and you're welcome to it. We see that same kind of attitude in a little boy. Okay, Jesus is with his disciples, and he has managed to gather a crowd. Well, every place Jesus went, he gathered a crowd. And you look out over the hillside, and there's people everywhere. And someone says, um, they're, they're hungry. And Jesus' response was, if they're hungry, feed them. Okay, you got to love Philip. Philip is quick with the answers. And he says, um, Jesus, um, I hate to be the one to say this. Have you looked at this crowd? Um, they're kind of like you. They're kind of scary at times. And Philip says, um, there's, there's a lot of people here. He said, um, I haven't counted, but it seems to me like there's four or 5,000 people. There's or four or 5,000 men, and then all of these men brought their families. Lord, there's 10, 12, 13, 14,000 people. It would take it would take three-fourths of a year's wage just to buy them a nibble. And Jesus says, well, what have you got? Okay, use your imagination. This is Doug's unauthorized version, okay? So here's this little boy, eight or so. Now, when this boy left home earlier that morning, Mama said, I'm going to pack a lunch for you, but don't do like you usually do and give it to somebody else. This is for you. Okay, so here's the crowd, and here's the little boy. He hears everything that's going on, and I can see him running up to Jesus and say, Hey, Mr. Jesus, he's tugging on his rope, and he says, Mr. Jesus, Mr. Jesus, I got a little bit of lunch. It's not much. It's not fancy. But it's yours. Use it. So we know the story. Jesus took the lunch. What happened? Fed how many? Oh, at least. And there's another part. So what's the next part? He took up what was left over. Now, the little boy had a couple of fish and a little bit of bread. Okay, for 15,000 people, 10,000, whatever, Jesus takes up, or the disciples take up, 12 baskets of leftovers. Wow. More leftovers than they started with. How does that happen? Only because God performed the miracle. Okay, we see the same kind of attitude. I told you, you guys are scary. I'm nervous. You see the same kind of attitude in Jesus when he was on the cross. He has been beaten, bloodied, ugly at that point. 
And he says, I don't have much. And it's certainly not fancy. But what I have is yours. And he offered his life for each of us. Now, if you stop and think of it, that really is a perfect example of sanctification. That's a word we don't hear very often. Uh, it's an archaic word. Sanctification is really... Um, let's back up a minute. Let's go to salvation. Salvation has two parts. We repent. We ask God for forgiveness. And God forgives us, wipes the slate clean. He says never to remember those sins anymore. He has wiped the slate clean. There are no sins in our life. Okay, sanctification then comes from the second thing that God does for us. And again, it has two parts. My part is a complete commitment that says, I don't have much, and it's not fancy, but what I have is yours, and you're welcome to it. Okay, God's part of that is that he takes that committed life and uses it, cleanses it, fills it with his Holy Spirit, and then uses it for his good, for his glory. Okay, think of it for a minute. I know it's scary to say I give up myself. I commit myself totally to God. Think of it this way. I give up, I give God all of me. He gives me all of him. That's a pretty good trade. So let me ask you this, and you'll be, you'll be glad that this is the shortest sermon you've ever heard. <laughs> let me ask you this. What do you have in your hand today? Let me ask that just a little bit different. What are you holding on to that keeps you from that total commitment? Habits, finances, relationships? What is more important in your life than receiving all of God? You know what? I still think it's a really good trade. We give God all of us, broken, battered, empty, useless. And he gives us all of him, filled, powerful, and ready to meet the world.